Hello and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Pastor Jacob Swenson and I am your guide as we are working our way through the Book of Concord. We continue today where we left off in the Augsburg Confession. Now I'm looking back through my schedule and in our last time together we did all of Article 26. I, I Looking at my schedule I was only supposed to do one half of that and then the other half of that today, but luckily for you we got it all yesterday. Um, and that was a really good article. It was on the distinction of meats, but not really. It talked about the use of of tradition and the, and the place that tradition has in the church. And we as Lutherans say, well, tradition is good, but humanly instituted traditions and rites do not count towards salvation. So, in the case of good traditions, we, we keep them. Traditions that are useful for good order, such as going to church on Sunday and having Easter and using the liturgy. These things are good because they teach and preserve order. However, things like the distinguishing distinction between meats, where you can only eat certain meats, and you know requiring to go to the Mass and all these things, these we do a little bit some purifying on. So Article 26 was titled this distinction of meats, but I think you found and I found as well that it's not primarily about meat. Now today we're going to continue with Article 27. So we're getting near to the end of the Augsburg Confession. And this article is a long one, so we are going to split it up today and tomorrow. This article is on monastic vows. I'm going to read the the editorial note. I've got Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, which is the Missouri Synod's kind of, I guess, semi-official translation of the Book of Concord. It's available through Concordia Publishing House. I'm going to read the editorial note here. It says, This article has in view Martin Luther's experience in the monastery, along with what other former monks had to say about life in the cloister. The idea that a person should hide himself behind the walls of a monastery and perform spiritual works to make himself more worthy of God's favor has no biblical justification at all. During the Middle Ages, many common people believed that only priests, monks, or nuns were truly performing spiritual work. But such a view contradicts God's word, which teaches how all of life is an opportunity to serve God, giving him glory by serving our neighbor. Even today, it is assumed that activities at church are somehow of greater value than the common, everyday duties life requires of us. This article extols such biblical duties as being a faithful husband, wife, son, or daughter, and takes great care to reject monasticism and explain how harmful and dangerous it is for those who are entrapped in it. Forcing chastity on those who have not been given this gift is particularly harmful, since many are led to believe they merit God's grace by means of their sacrifice, and not the sacrifice of Christ. Right, so this is kind of a a commentary on the Lutheran doctrine of vocation. So if you've been listening since we were in the large catechism, particularly in the commandments in the large catechism, Luther really rails against the monastics, against the the monks and nuns who who feel and teach that they're cloistering themselves away and saying the Mass and praying all hours of the day is more holy than being a father and going out and milking the cows. And that's just not true. We have all been given vocations by God, and we are called by God to serve in those vocations, whether it's father or mother or son or daughter or grandfather or farmer or whatever. Every vocation we have is an opportunity for us to love and serve God and our neighbor. Becoming a monk does not make you more holy. Uh, Same thing for me. I'm a pastor. Uh, Just because my vocation is pastor does not make me more holy than my parishioners. Right? I do not have an indelible character. I am not holier at a level above my parishioners. No, it's just this is my my vocation. I have other vocations, such as husband, in which I seek to to serve my wife uh, in response to the love that I've received in Christ. Um, So I'm not more holy because I'm a pastor. So that's kind of understanding that Luther 
or not Luther, but the Reformers are going to get at here in Article 27. Let's go ahead with Paragraph 1. It will be easier to understand what we teach about monastic vows by considering the state of the monasteries and how many things were done every day contrary to canon law. In Augustine's time, they were free associations. Later, when discipline was corrupted, vows were added for the purpose of restoring discipline, as in a carefully planned prison. Gradually, many other regulations were added besides vows. These binding rules were laid upon many before the lawful age, contrary to canon law. Many entered monastic life through ignorance. They were not able to judge their own strength, though they were old enough. They were trapped and compelled to remain, even though some could have been freed by the kind, of, the kind provision of canon law. This was more the case in convents of women than amongst, although more consideration should have been shown the weaker sex. This rigor displeased many good people before this time, who saw that young men and women were thrown into convents for a living. They saw what unfortunate results came of this procedure, how it created scandals, and what snares were cast upon consciences. They were sad that the authority of canon law in so great a matter was utterly set aside and despised. In addition to all these evil things, a view of vows was added that displeased even the more considerate monks. They taught that monastic vows were equal to baptism. They taught that a monastic life merited forgiveness of sins and justification before God. Yes, they even added that the monastic life not only merited righteousness before God, but even greater merit, since it was said that the monastic life not only kept God's basic law, but also the so-called evangelical councils. Right, so look how the the article is beginning. It's, it's saying that, uh, well, first of all, according to canon law, not even, we haven't even talked about scripture really here. Uh, he's, even according to canon law, monasticism in the time of the reformers is a far cry from how it was invented. And so they go back to Augustine. They say, during Augustine's time, these monasteries were were free associations. No one was compelled to to join a monastery. You were you were free in joining and, and leaving. Uh, however, then because discipline started to lack, that's when vows came in place. That you would take a vow when you join the monastery, um, but only that was to be an aid toward self discipline. Uh, however, over time, many other regulations started being added on top of the vows, um, and many of these were placed upon children before they were even able to to make vows of this nature, which is contrary to canon law, the Reformers say. Um, and then what started was many entered into monastic life through through ignorance, that even though they were old enough, they were not clearly understanding what monastic life entails. And this is the case of, of people who would, well, if you can't feed your kid, you send him off to the monastery or to the convent. And uh, I guess he gets to be a monk or she gets to be a nun for the rest of her life uh, because you couldn't feed them, even though you probably could. Um, this was the case, the reformers say, especially with nuns, that they were carted off to the convent uh, without even a consideration. And then, on top of this, things started getting even worse, that that even the most considerate monks were offended by this, that it began to be taught them that, that monastic vows were of more value, or at least equal to baptism, and that's just terrible. Uh, and then, it became taught that monastic vows earned the forgiveness of sins and merited righteousness. And, and so you can see that just... This ball of yarn just keeps becoming bigger and bigger. And we haven't even talked about scripture yet. All of this has just been against canon law. Paragraph 13. So they made people believe that the profession of monasticism was far better than baptism and that the monastic life was more meritorious than that of rulers, pastors, and others who serve in their calling according to God's commands without any man-made services. None of these things can be denied, 
this is all found in their own books about monasticism. Now, one thing that might pop out to you there, monks and pastors or monks and priests are not the same thing. It's kind of confusing if you've never talked about this before, uh, but monks and priests are not the same thing. Some monks are priests, but in, in many cases they aren't. That's why they're called brother and, and not father. Um, that's a simple way of looking at it. Uh, but monks and priests are not coterminous. Um, sometime later we can talk about this a little bit more. But suffice it to say, monks and priests are not the same thing. Okay. And so far the Reformers say that, that none of these things, these these corruptions of the monasteries, none of this can be denied because even the the, Ro- the Roman Catholic books about monasticism talk about these things. So none of this stuff is and is anything that the Lutherans are making up. Paragraph fifteen. How did all this come in come about in the monasteries? Well, at one time they were schools of theology and other branches of learning, producing pastors and bishops for the benefit of the church. Now it is another thing. It is needless to go over what everyone knows. Before they came together for the sake of learning. Now they claim that monasticism is a lifestyle instituted to merit grace and righteousness. They even preach that it is a state of perfection. They put monasticism far above all other kinds of life ordained by God. We have mentioned all these things without hateful exaggeration, so that our teacher's doctrine on monasticism may be better understood. Right? So monasteries started out as, as places of education, things that weren't bad. But now things have changed. And, and so the reformers say, we're just pointing this out. We're not exaggerating. We're pointing this out to make it clear what we teach. Paragraph 18. First, concerning monks who marry. Our teachers say that it is lawful for anyone who is not suited for the single life to enter into marriage. Monastic vows cannot destroy what God has commanded and ordained. God's commandment is this. Because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife. This is not just a command given by God. God has created and ordained marriage for those who are not given an exception to natural order by God's special work. We've talked about this before, that not everyone has the gift of celibacy. If you do not have the special gift of God to remain chaste and celibate, then get married. This is what is taught according to the text in Genesis 2. It is not good that man should be alone. Therefore, those who obey this command and ordinance of God do not sin. It is not a sin to marry. Properly understood. Paragraph 22. What objection can be raised to this? Let people praise the obligation of a monastic vow as much as they want but they will never be able to destroy God's commandment by means of a monastic vow. Canon law teaches that superiors can make exceptions to monastic vows. How much less are such monastic vows enforced that are contrary to God's commandments? If, in fact, an obligation to a monastic vow could never be changed for any reason, the Roman popes could never have granted exceptions to the vows. For it is not lawful for someone to make an exception to what is truly from God. Ha! Oh, that's clever. So the reformers are saying, if God has truly commanded something, then then we can't make exceptions for it. Uh, but we've seen bishops and popes making exceptions for monastic vows and all these things. So if God really commanded it, why are they making these exceptions? And I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. That was an interesting point. For it is not lawful for someone to make an exception to what is truly from God. The Roman pontiffs have wisely judged that mercy is to be observed in these monastic obligations. That is why we read that many times they have made special arrangements and exceptions with monastic vows. The case of king, the king of Aragon, who was called back from the monastery, is well known. And there are also examples in our own times. Um, maybe an example for us would be 
there are some monks who are married, who receive special dispensation to be married, and now if the command for celibacy is really from God, then who are we to make exceptions? I think we'll leave it right there, that we just finished paragraph 26, and tomorrow we'll pick up in paragraph 27 and, and finish this article before going on to article 28. So I'll see you tomorrow. Take care.